This presentation is called, What Does It Mean to Optimize? So what is optimization? Well, as it turns out, it has two characteristics. And one is it's really important in evolutionary theory. And the other is you usually don't get into a discussion of it too much until first year calculus. So optimization is a mathematical concept, and we've got the challenge of explaining it and keeping it in basic arithmetic. So as a prelude to an example, and we can do that, so there are examples of optimization that are in pre-calculus. And as a prelude, and note that when we add numbers, the result is called a sum. So the sum of 5 and 5 is 10. And when we multiply, the result is called a product. So the product of 5 and 5 is 25. And that difference between a sum and a product is going to be important in our example. So here's our example. We start with the number 10. And then we list the pairs of whole numbers, including 0, that sum to 10. And this might be 5 plus 5, that equals 10. And 4 plus 6 equals 10. Similarly, 3 plus 7 equals 10, and 2 plus 8, 10 plus 0, and 1 plus 9. So we can work out all of those numbers, pairs of numbers that sum to 10. And here's our optimization problem. Which of those pairs of numbers, when we multiply them, will create the largest product? So now we're going to take the numbers that we've added that sum to 10, and we're going to multiply them. And what we want to know is which of those pairs of numbers produce the largest product. So let's check out the math here. If we take 0 times 10, we get 0. That's not very promising. 1 times 9, though, gives us 9. So that's a bigger number. However, if we take 2 times 8, we get 16. And notice that 16 is quite a bit larger than 9. And something else is happening. And if you subtract 2 from 8, the difference between them is 6. Whereas you, if you subtract 1 from 9, the difference between them is 8. So the difference between the numbers is getting smaller and at the same time, their product is getting larger. And we can see that with 3 times 7 equals 21. The difference between them is only 4. So this might be a pattern, right? 4 times 6 equals 24. And 5 times 5 equals 25. And here's the question then, can we do any other combinations of these numbers that will lead to a product bigger than 25? And the answer is no, we cannot. So the winner is 5 times 5. And notice that that winning number is simply 10 divided by 2. So let's try the number 20. We have the same problem. What pairs of whole numbers sum to 20? And if we leave 0 out, there's 10 pairs. 10 plus 10, 9 plus 11. Uh, 18 plus 2, 16 plus 4, we're not going to list them all, but you can list them all on a piece of paper and then multiply them. And which of those pairs will produce the largest product? Well, let's check out the math here. 2 times 18 is 36. Notice that the difference between 2 and 18 is 16. Whereas 5 times 15 is 75. Now the difference between those two numbers is only 10, and their product is much larger. Well, let's keep following this out. 7 times 13 is 91, and 9 times 11 is 99. And the question is, can we get any bigger than 99? And yes, we can. Uh, 10 times 10 equals 100. 
So that's the winner, 10 times 10, and notice that 10 is simply 20 divided by 2. So we've got a pattern here that all we have to do is take the number and divide it by 2 into two equal parts and multiply those parts and we'll get the largest product. Well, let's try the number 60 in something a little different. Let's consider triplets of whole numbers that sum to 60. For example, that might be 32 plus 18 plus 10, or 40 plus 15 plus 5, or 25 plus 20 plus 15. Quite a number of choices, but which of those triplets will produce the largest product? when we multiply them. And we can just skip the step of working through the different possible combinations and say that the answer is going to be 20 times 20 times 20, which equals 8,000. And you can work this out on paper, but the winner is 20 times 20 times 20, which is simply 60 divided by 3. And so we've arrived here at a rule of how to optimize the product of numbers uh, that add to a certain number. And if I was to ask you now what three numbers that sum to 150 will have the largest product when multiplied against one another, you know that the answer is going to be 50 times 50 times 50 because 150 divided by 3 equals 50. Well, that's kind of a trivial example. One of those examples where you might say, well, what am I ever going to do with that? And I don't know. But it shows that to optimize is to maximize. And of course, sometimes to optimize is to minimize. That might be when you're trying to minimize your fuel consumption. And this is a central concern of both economists and engineers. They're the champions at optimizing. And you'll study a lot of calculus that has to do with optimizing if you take up either of those fields. But what does it have to do uh, with evolution and anthropology? Well, let's take an economic example before we get into that. And this is one that most of you are probably familiar with from high school. So how do we optimize market efficiency? We're going to represent this using an X and a Y axis. So the vertical Y axis represents the price. And as you go up that Y axis, the price is increasing. So the price is highest at the top and lowest at the bottom. And now we're going to put the horizontal x-axis, and this is going to represent the quantity of some commodity. And the quantity is fewest towards the intersection with the y-axis, and it's going to be largest away from that. So this is the standard x and y-axis that economists use. And then they draw this line that slopes upward from left to right, and that's to show supply. And that's based on the expectation that as price increases, supply will increase. And then they draw another line that slopes downward from left to right, and that's to represent demand. And that's to show that as supply increases, the demand decreases because those demands are presumably met. So this shows us some inefficiencies that can occur in a market. When less is being produced uh, than is demanded, there's too few and the market is inefficient because more people want that commodity than can purchase it. However, when more is being produced than people want, that's also inefficient because now too many items are being produced uh, more than people want. And this means that the most efficient point for a market is going to be at what's called equilibrium. And that's where supply, the supply line crosses the demand line. That marks the point where 
exactly the number of what's wanted, let's say toasters, um, you produce just enough toasters to meet demand, there's no uh, surplus and there's also no excess demand that's unmet. So that's a model of market efficiency. We could try to put this uh, into something more useful and consider buying used textbooks which move on markets according to supply and demand, unlike new textbooks uh, which are sometimes insensitive to supply and demand. So the question we have here, which is pragmatic, is optimally, when should you buy and sell your used textbook? And what you should do is you should buy it when the supply greatly exceeds the demand, this will drive the price to its lowest point. And when's that going to be? That's going to be in the last couple of weeks of the semester, because that's when most students will be dumping their textbooks and selling them. And as a result, supply will grow. And because nobody else or very few students are buying textbooks for the next semester in the last two weeks of the semester, that means that prices will be low. And when then should you sell? Well, you should sell your textbooks in the first two weeks of the new semester when the demand is likely to outstrip the supply. And if you do this, you might be able to buy, the, buy a textbook for a dollar and then turn around and sell it uh, for $60. So this brings us then uh, to the area of economics that's most closely connected to evolutionary theory and this is microeconomics, which studies how individuals make decisions. So when we reach that fork in the road, how do we decide which way to go? And microeconomics is about situations where we can reason and arrive at a rational decision about which way to go. So there's three easy pieces to what's called decision theory, which is the most influential outcome of microeconomics means we can cross out one of these puzzle pieces. We only need three. And the first piece is scarcity. So scarcity is what creates the necessity of choice. If there was no scarcity, uh, we would not have to choose. We could eat our cake and have it too. But the idea behind scarcity is that everything requires a choice and that includes an all-you-can-eat buffet. You have to, you can't eat everything there constantly, so you have to choose what you're going to eat, even in an all-you-can-eat buffet. The second are cost and benefits, and this is the basis of rational choice, that we can weigh the cost and the benefits of our choices. And the third uh, piece of decision theory is the idea of margins. And this is just the idea that cost and benefits are constantly changing. So they're not steady, uh, but they vary. So let's illustrate these ideas and expand on them a little. When we're talking about scarcity, this is used as constraints that have a lot to do with how we weigh the cost and benefits. So constraints provide measures that we can use in determining cost and benefits. And can, a constraint might be time and it might be energy. But it's something that's characterized by scarcity that we then have to budget in some manner. And here's a tiger eating an antelope. And we might ask, well, why is the tiger eating a large animal why doesn't the tiger simply eat mice like this cat? And we, if we think about that, it might turn out that the energy that the tiger would put into catching mice uh, wouldn't produce enough return to keep the tiger going. So cost and benefits travel together and they form a ratio of benefits to cost. And this is the heart of rational choice. And a rule that evolutionary thinkers uh, build from, especially when they're studying food getting activities, is that the energy inputs have to be greater than or equal to the energy outputs. 
and this would predict something about the behavior of tigers as opposed to cats, um, that house cats might be able to create that energy balance eating mice, but we expect that a tiger might have to eat larger game. And how about this idea of margins, that cost and benefits are not stable and they fluctuate? Well, this is often discussed as diminishing marginal utility. And this is the idea that as we get more of something, often we want it less. So if you're sleeping, you probably want that sleep much more each minute of sleep during the first hour that you're sleeping. And after you've slept 12 hours, you may start to not want to sleep nearly as much. Uh, similarly, if you're hungry and you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, uh, you might very much want the first item that you take. But after you've sat there and gorged yourself for an hour, um, even the best desserts might have minimal attraction to you. And that's the idea that the cost and benefits of the things that we make use of aren't stable, but they're constantly changing. And it's because of that constant change that you need to study calculus um, to really understand optimization. It should give you a motivation to hang in there. So economics, as we know, is prescriptive. It tells us how to economize and that we should economize and exercise rational choice. So how's that related to evolution? And the answer is that what's called evolutionary economics predicts that natural selection favors economizing. And so there's this expectation in what we're going to look at next, an area of theory called optimal foraging theory, that animals, including humans, will act like economists. They'll weigh the cost and benefits, and they'll act in ways that are efficient and optimize their energy when they're out there gathering food and hunting prey. Thank you for listening.